are on our series called The Holy Bible. Yes, so take out your notebook or take out your Bible, take out whatever you want except for your Instagram or your social media because these next 28 minutes or 24, 26 minutes, we are gonna dive into the word of God and we are talking about the Bible, the holy book, God's word and it's not just as we've learned in these last couple of weeks, it's not just this historical book. It is not just a book of moral teachings, but it is the foundation. It is the foundation to our faith, to our Christian faith. It is what we build our faith upon. And the more we understand the Bible, the more we understand God's heart, the more we understand God's will, the more we understand his promises, his character, and what he wants for our lives. Can you say amen? Yes, the Bible, it is the inspired word of God. It is not just a book of stories and teachings. It is not just a book of rules and regulations. No, it is not that. It's living, it's breathing, a testament of God's love, of his wisdom, of his guidance. Actually, Hebrews 4.12 says the following. It says, for the word of God is what? It's alive and it is active. It is working inside of us. Can you believe that? The word of God is living. It's powerful. It's doing something. It's capable of transforming. So as you're listening to the word of God, it is working. You don't just come to church and listen to words that I'm saying. You are listening to the word of God and the word of God is provoking transformation inside of you as you are listening to it. And it says that it's guiding us into righteousness. Righteousness is right living. Living the right way. And I don't know about you, but many times I find myself wanting to live the wrong way. <laughs> like when you're on the freeway in traffic, you're thinking the, right, the wrong things. You're wanting to lift up the wrong finger. I don't know about you, you know? But instead you're like. Or as my daughter says, when someone's bad and she's like, she wants to lift up a finger, but rather she's like, bad. You did bad. Right? And it's like, I'm like, babe, I don't know if that's, that's good, right? But I always say that the word of God reminds us that we're Christians. Right? And it's like, hey, Myra, remember you're a Christian. When you see something, you want to say something, and you're about to say it, and you're like, mm, hold on. The Holy Spirit inside of you reminds you that, hey, you're not supposed to say that. You want to say it. You're thinking it. And then you're like, hold up, wait a minute. Shouldn't be thinking that. Let me correct myself. I'm a Christian. I'm a daughter of God. He's working inside of me. See, that, that's what he does. He leads us into righteousness. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, all scripture is God. I love this version in, in the NIV. All scripture is God breathed and it is useful but the emphasis here is that God breathed it's God breathed and it's yes it's useful for the teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness but it's God breathed the scriptures are the breath of God the word of God not men God breathes this this Bible when you open it it is not just words written on pages. It is not another book. It is not another series. It is not just good advice. It is not a help, another help, you know, a self-help book or theories of men or stories. But it's inspired, it's directed, orchestrated, it's birthed through his very heart and written by the Holy Spirit. This thought is so precisely explained by Peter in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. It says this, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture 
ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. They spoke from God. They were carried along. They were influenced by the very breath of God, the pneuma of God. They moved as they were moved. They spoke as they received the word of God. They are not the origin, but they are the instrument. They are the channel. And this is the, the title of the message, this divine duo on the Pentecost Sunday, the word and the spirit, the word and the spirit. Now, depending on your Christian t tradition, on your denomination or your experience in church, you might have noticed that the word of God and the spirit of God get separated into two very distinct extremes. That when you go into different churches, you find that there's usually two different extremes of churches. You get the churches that are all about the Holy Spirit. And then you get on the other side, the churches that are all about the word of God. And it seems like they are actually on complete opposites of one another. On one side, you get one church or one denomination emphasizing the spirit, the Holy Spirit. But sometimes they neglect completely the word of God. And that takes them to all kinds of crazy. You get sister helicopter. Usually you have sister helicopter going, and I'm not making fun of it. I'm just saying it, it's, it gets pretty crazy because it's all about the Holy Spirit, all about the goosebumps and all about the move of and the feelings and, the, and all about just the expression. But many times this can lead to emotionalism and sensationalism, and it's all about just feeling something but then there is no word and it's all about the move. But on the other side, you may have some very intellectual churches that heavily emphasize just the word of God. And they want nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. And they think Pentecost Sunday, let's not even say the word Pentecost. Because that's Pentecostal. And only in the Pentecostal churches can they do Pentecost. No. What, what are you guys talking about? It's in the Bible. The Holy Spirit's in the Bible from the very beginning. And he's at the end. In the very end, the Holy Spirit and the churches telling Jesus, come, Jesus, come. Inviting Jesus to come. He's in the entire Bible. And when it's all word, all word and all knowledge, but then they become very dry and very lifeless without the Spirit. The word becomes all letter on pages, leading to legalism, leading to puffed up just this knowledge in this form of religion. And this is tragedy, church, because the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the breath of God is the, with the Word of God. The Bible were always meant to be together and never separate because the Bible is that. The Bible is that. Come on. Come on. If you're going to applaud, applaud. Yes. This is the Word, the breath of God. They're not just letters on pages. These are words, his words, the breath. When you open it and you begin to read, it is the Holy Spirit begins to move. Maintaining a balance of the word of God. And the Holy Spirit is crucial for our Christian life. We must allow them to complement each other, to complete each other. 
And what better Sunday than Pentecost Sunday to talk about this beautiful, powerful relationship between the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people say, ooh, Pentecost Sunday, and they they shiver and they quiver, and they don't even want to mention Pentecost on Pentecost Sunday. But did you know that Pentecost, you want to know what Pentecost means? Fifty. Penta, five. Coste, a, a hundred, I, I mean tenth. Penta costs 50. That's what it means. Because it's 50, 50 days. 50 days after Easter, 50 days after Jesus resurrected, a.k.a. the birth of the Christian church. Pentecost is a pivotal event in our history that not only commemorates when the descent of the Holy Spirit on the disciples and all of those that were gathered together, but also the, the demonstrates the incredible power that it had on the word of God that was preached from the, from the mouth of the disciples. And after Pentecost, Peter, empowered by the Holy Spirit, stood up and delivered a message. The same Peter that had denied Jesus. The same Peter that had hid. The same Peter that was afraid. That same Peter was able to stand up and was able to say, hey, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Jesus follower. I know that he died, but he resurrected on the third day. And he was able to deliver that message. Yes, because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And guess what Acts 2.37 says? We don't have to guess because we could read it in the Bible. It says the following. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, listen. So they were hearing Peter preach. They heard the words of Peter. When they heard the words of Peter about Jesus, They said this, brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? The question was, what shall we do to have what you have? What shall we do to believe? What shall we do to have Jesus in our hearts? There was this urgent need of salvation. There was this urgent need to have what Peter had, to be filled with what Peter was filled with. And Peter tells them in in Acts 2.38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you. Repent means, hey, stop doing what you're doing. Turn the other way. Turn to Jesus, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift. Say with me, the gift. It's a gift. Of what? Of the Holy Spirit. Gift. Not earned or deserved, but given. Received freely from a loving Father, and what was this gift? The gift of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. From the very beginning, the Holy Spirit was present. God the Father, in this moment, this is doctrine here, God the Father is in heaven. At his right hand side, It's not the Virgin Mary, it's Jesus, his son. This is doctrine, this is truth. This isn't tradition, this is truth. This is what the Bible states. The right hand of the Father is Jesus, the son. With us on earth is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us. The Holy Spirit is inside of us and can be inside of us. And the Holy Spirit can be upon us. And one of the most common misinterpretations is viewing the Holy Spirit only as an energy. And this is where people get all, ooh, ooh. I'm sorry, but you go to churches and they're like, 
And they only see the Holy Spirit as an energy. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. And the person is not just, the Holy Spirit doesn't just come to give you goosebumps to make you feel. But the Holy Spirit has a will, has emotions, and has intelligence. He speaks, he teaches, he guides, and he can be grieved, the word of God says. He is a comforter. He is an advocate, and he is a helper. The Holy Spirit is referred to as a parakletos, which means he is one that is at our side, specifically to aid us. Like I said, he is with us. He is working inside of us. The power of the word of God is evident then when he has the Holy Spirit on Peter and he's preaching the word of God. And it says so wonderfully that that day when Peter preached on Pentecost, 3,000 converted and gave their lives to Jesus. Did you know in the Old Testament, Pentecost was actually in Jewish tradition was something observed because it was actually what they observed when they received the law of Moses. They received the Ten Commandments on that day. So in Jewish tradition, but do you remember when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, what he found? They had, they had built a calf of gold. He was so angry that they had built this calf of gold. He broke the commandments. And on that day, 3,000 people died. But on Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit descended and Peter preached the word of God, 3,000 people were saved. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it's God's redemptive power. It is the power of the Holy Spirit saying, I came to redeem what the enemy wanted to steal. The word of God preached became alive, like he says, and active, transforming Everything that the devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy, and bring in life and life more abundantly. We need the word, but the word with life given by the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen to that church? When Jesus announced to his disciples, hey, I'm leaving. Yep, you heard me right. I'm leaving. The disciples were like, no, don't go. He's like, uh, it's better for you that I go. Because I'm going to send you, my Father's going to send you the Holy Spirit. Don't worry. He's an advocate. He's a guide. He's going to be like, hey, Dad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advocate for them. You know what an advocate does? He's on your side. All the time when you're messing up, he's like, hey, I got your back. I'm advocating for you. I'm helping you. I'm guiding you. John 14, 26 says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So when you're about to do what you're about to do and you know it's kind of late and you're about to send that text and then something's like, uh-uh, don't do it. Mm-mm. the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Or if you did it, you're like, man, I did it. It's the Holy Spirit saying, but you're not gonna do it again because I'm with you. You did it, okay, but I'm here with you. I'm gonna help you not to do it again. See, you're not alone. I'm here with you. I'm the paracletos, I'm on your side. I'm advocating for you because you're not what you're doing. You are a child of God. You are better than what you did. I am here with you. That is the Holy Spirit. I'm not throwing you away. You are a child of God. See, the word of God provides us the truth, wisdom, and guidance while the Holy Spirit illuminates this truth and makes it real, makes it our truth. See, that's why the world can't accept him because they're blinded to him. They don't know him. They don't understand. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes the written word speak to our hearts. And it's more than just words on a page. 
Without the Holy Spirit, the reading of the Bible is just intellectual. But with the Holy Spirit, it becomes this transformation experience, this partnership. It is a partnership, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. So how can we practically engage this Word? And this is where I'm going to just give you some practical. When you open the Word of God, you're going to open it. When you open it in your daily life, so tonight or tomorrow when you're going to have your time with the Word of God, when you open it, you're going to say, Lord, show me. Holy Spirit, show me. That's your first step. Even before you're going to open it, you're going to just say, Holy Spirit, show me. I know you have something to show me. And not only are you going to show me, but you're going to speak to me with what you show me. You're going to speak to me. Yesterday, I was asked, so I know I shared this with you, but my nephew, 17 years old, about a month and a half ago, was brutally stabbed to death. And because of the Instagram, no, the social media, the TikTok, um, the video of his stabbing went viral. Very sad. And my family was just so distraught in California with everything. They were selling merch with his face and with, it was, it, was, it was a mess. It was a mess. So because of that, the family decided to wait over a month in order to have the memorial service. And a couple of days ago, I received a message from my cousin, and she said, Could, will you please read a scriptural passage during the memorial service? Sounds easy enough. But when you're thinking there and you're like, my grandmother's sitting there. This is her great-grandson. Her mother, you know, his mother's sitting there. His father, my cousin. Family, friends. There was over 700, 800 people there. All that loved him. 17-year-old. And I literally went through this, opening up the scripture and asking the Holy Spirit, show me. Show me, what, sh what should I read? There's so many people there. Some know you and so many don't. There is hundreds a 15, 16, 17-year-old boys and girls that don't know you. And I have this opportunity, this opportunity to sow a seed. Holy Spirit, show me. Speak to me. And as I took the stage, Oh my gosh, I just felt the Holy Spirit inside of me. I was shaking to my bones. I could feel the, the blood rushing through my veins. My heart was, I, I just, I felt so like, oh, it was, it was something I haven't felt in so long. Opening up the scripture that I had chosen, having to look at my cousin and my cousins that had lost their son. It wasn't just reading another scripture. It was reading it to them. And the Holy Spirit showed me. Romans 8. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? 
or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons. Neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Holy Spirit, show me. Holy Spirit, speak to me. And number three, Holy Spirit, may your word transform me. This is when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. This is when the word moves from here to here. This is where you put it on, but then you have it inside of you. Where it's working, where it's pruning and, and transforming and taking things off. Holy Spirit, show me. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit, transform me. On this Pentecost Sunday, church, as we're journeying through this this series of the Holy Bible. My prayer for you is that you would see it as more than a book. That as you open it up, as you journey through the pages, that you would love it, that you would really see it as the word of God. That when we read it, we don't merely listen to the word and so deceive ourselves, as James 1.22 says. Don't just read it, deceiving yourselves. Do what it says. Stand to your feet. And so that is our Bible memorization verse for this week. Do you remember the Bible memorization verse for two weeks ago? Psalms, the longest, the longest Bible chapter. What is the longest Bible chapter in the Bible? Psalms 119, thank you. What is the shortest? Psalms 117, thank you. Psalms 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The Bible memorization passage, we're just doing this during this series, is going to be James 122. And I hope that you take this into your heart. James 122. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let's say it together. James 1, 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Let's say it for a second time. James 1, 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now we're gonna take it off the screens. Say it with me. James 1, 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So I wanna invite you in this moment to close your eyes. Do not merely listen. Do not merely listen today. Deceiving yourself, do what it says. I wanna invite you today to open up your heart 
You've listened to the word. You've seen the work of the Holy Spirit. You've seen that you need the Holy Spirit to actually do the work inside of you. And I wanna invite you to invite Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. Maybe you've thought that the work had to be done by yourself, but let me invite you to allow him, to allow him to do the work, to do the transformation work inside of you. What do you have to do to have that ticket into heaven? That free gift of eternal life, that transformation power of the Holy Spirit, you need to receive it. Believe in Jesus. Believe that he died on that cross and that he rose again on that third day, paying the price for your salvation. Open up your heart and say, come on in, Jesus. Come on in. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I want to invite you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father. Come on, church. Heavenly Father, I admit that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short, that I need guiding, that I need saving, that I can't do this on my own. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Holy Spirit, transform my heart. Work inside of me. Never leave me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Every eye.